Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of Around the Fire, where just like our ancestors used to sit around the fire to listen to one of their elders tell them about some of their communities, ancient stories and legends, we also sit around a symbolic fire to discuss events in African history. The aim of this podcast is to celebrate the victories of our ancestors try and emulate their successes while also avoiding any errors that they may have made in the course of history. This is what they would have asked us to do if we could ask them now and hear their replies. My name is Letzela Mariri. I come from South Africa and history is my baby. But of course, I'm not alone. I'm chilling with my fellow history buffs. Habariyako Joan. Mzuri sana. My name is Auma Omolo, just a straightforward East African girl. And of course, sometimes I call you small, and other people yes. call you Joanna. Right. So I am small. I actually like the name Cooper, so we'll change it to Cooper. That's on the sana. Abariyako Prof- Professor S. Mzuri sana. Um, I am uh, from the Gulf Coast of the United States. Uh, probably, well, actually voted by CNN as the most African uh, piece of the United States. I'm the pest who <laughs> continuously calls them professor, even after they deny and ask me to cease and desist. So to the audience, uh, when you hear me doing this to them, uh, it's a bad habit. I mean no harm. And thank you in advance for sitting through my lectures. Class is now in session. Sanda sana. And with that said, habari yenu to you, our listeners. We invite you to sit here with us as we reminisce about those old, unforgettable events. All right, Professor S. Professor S. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what are you telling us about today? Well, today um, I'm going to talk about Africanisms, um, the uh, African customs uh, that are uh, that and um, language uh, remnants that are held by Africans in the diaspora. Now, uh, most of it is, is more known about in the Americas specifically, but I'm not going to exclude um, the Africanisms that are in either direction from the continent in this diaspora. It's just that most of it will come out of the Americas because that's where it's most documented. Um, but I'll be talking about those things, the, the elements of uh, African customs from different parts of the continent. Most of it will be from the Western Central um, that have an impact on the cultures of um, the nations of the diaspora, the nations in which we live outside of the continent. Um, now, the thing about this one is that neither one of us really gets gl- uh, glorified in this one. Um, because I, as an African-American, can only take credit that we held on to these things. And of course, this was done before I was born anyway. But the ones who actually started these customs are Western Central Africans. And um, I'm not going to try to share the credit with them, even though I come from them. I won't try to share that credit with them for starting these customs. And so this is a situation in which neither one of us really gets a whole lot of glory, uh, but rather we're giving credit to where it's due to someone else. Um, But um, most of the Africanisms actually uh, are known about um, in, uh, believe it or not, they're not, there there are not as many in the United States that are known as there are uh, in Brazil. Um, Brazil seems, in terms of pure numbers, Brazil seems to lead uh, in um, how many Africanisms that there are. Um, there are uh, uh, there are many effects, though, of African languages on uh, Brazilian Portuguese and on um, the Spanish that is spoken in the Americas, uh, specifically in Cuba and Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic. Um, that's where you have the most, the most that are known about, or the most that have been documented. Um, it's, a, it's actually something that has been looked up, though, uh, in um, going back as far as the 1940s, I believe. But that, that first study that I knew of was in the United States. That was in uh, the coast of Georgia and South Carolina amongst the Gullah and Geechee people. Um, and... Um, Language is one of the easier things for people to actually do a study on uh, with less controversy. Um, But uh, I'm also going to be talking about um, dance, um, food, uh, and even medicine to a certain extent. Um, And if we have time to do it this week, then I'll even talk about uh, the the cattle raising practices 
in the Americas that came from the continent. Um, so before I get started, can I ask, um, I want to give you guys a chance to ask any preliminary questions, anything that's just floating around in your head that's not based on anything that I'm about to present, but based on anything you may have heard before. Mm, no questions uh, on my end. Okay. Yeah, no, for me, just for clarification, these are, are you talking about customs that came with Africans to the Americas recently or during the slave trade or during which period or is it is this in general uh most of it will be during the slave trade because of the sheer numbers that made that trip um but i would not exclude any particular time period to be honest with you uh, okay. um, it's just that uh, usually it, it is normally referred to this term is used to refer to those that survived the slave trade because um those who came before columbus could bring what they wanted and they weren't really forced to give it up until the coming of the Spaniards, then the French, Portuguese and the British and um, yeah, and those guys and the Dutch later on. Um, only then when Europeans began to go into the Americas did they force Africans to give up and original Americans too, to give up anything that made them distinct. If they could have forced them to give up melanin, they would have done that too. Um, yeah. But um, I'm not excluding um, any particular time period. It's just that the most information is going to come from what survived the actual slave trade. Um, now, did um, even though neither of you are West or Central African, although we share blood with them and share ancestry, um, do you all um, hear anything about Africanisms? Have you even heard the term Africanisms before? No. Okay. All right. So this is not only. Yeah, a I mean, I have a general idea. Uh, okay. All right. So in that case, what I'll do is I'll start uh, with, um, I'm going to start with one of the most obvious and one of the most confusing, and this will actually help clarify things for most of us uh, coming out of the, um, coming out of North America, because we tend to be geographically ignorant as is known. Americans and yeah. uh, Americans and Saudis are known for not knowing where things are on the map. Um, and I belong to a Facebook group that demonstrates this every day. Uh, we laugh at these mistakes that people are making. One guy showed a picture of, of uh, showed a picture of Africa, but then he showed it inside of Australia like Africa was smaller. And he said, uh -huh. this is Africa. And it, to make matters worse, he said, this is Africa inside of Europe. So he thought that Australia was Europe. <laughs> So, yeah, but before we before we carry on, um, just for people, for for those who might not know what we mean when we say Americas, because we can assume everyone knows that, um, it's important for people to know that the Americas refers to North America, South America, and the, um, and and the um, islands. Yes, sir. And the islands. Yes, yes sir. to and yes. Exactly. When okay. I say the, the Americas, Jamaica. yeah, when I say the Americas, I'm referring um, to um, from the top of Canada down to the tip of Chile and Argentina, what they call the Tierra del Fuego and the islands in between. Um, yeah. But um, unfortunately, North Americans are really known for being geographically ignorant and, and Americans from the U.S. even worse, because many, many of us think that Canada is a part of the U.S., but it's not. Um, you'd be shocked the number that crossed the border the first time and um, find out that even though the U.S. dollar is accepted, that Canada has its own money. You'd be shocked about that. Um, some people buy, uh, uh, for the cell phones, they buy packets. It's good for all throughout the United States. Going to Canada, make phone calls, and then they have to pay roaming charges internationally. And um, they really pitch fit about it um, because of just lack of geographical knowledge. Um, Yankees can be pretty bad about that. And... Um, because of that, I mean, how many of you have, have heard of Americans that don't know that that don't know where Jamaica is and where Jamaica's not? How many of y'all have heard of that? I've heard Americans don't know where everything is. Okay. Guys, you guys are harsh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Russell Peters makes a joke <laughs> in in one of his sets. He talks about uh he was he was doing stand-up in America and he said, I was in South Africa and somebody from the 
Okay, uh, let me check the sound. Okay, your voice went out, uh, Litzella, but uh, um, Oma, I think that what he was talking about was uh, uh, the joke where he said he went to South Africa and somebody in the audience screamed out, Yaman! Um, and <laughs> he said, I said I went to South Africa, not Jamaica. What's wrong Jamaica. with <laughs> um, But some of that confusion comes about because of the, the English that the Jamaicans speak. Um, Jamaicans speak their own English and they speak formal English. The formal English is the official language, but they have their <clears> own <throat> Jamaican patois and it does have roots in African languages, uh, specifically mm -hmm. the Niger Congo language family. Um, and one of the ways that they can tell is not only by vocabulary, uh, like for instance, uh, Nyam, N-Y-A-M, that means to eat. And uh, mm -hmm. are you coming from the opposite end, I'm not expecting you to find this to be familiar. Um, but that's just some of the evidence. But one of the, uh, the other things is that they tend to use one verb tense. And they mm -hmm. add an auxiliary verb instead of changing the verb to the past verb. Uh, so they may, and sometimes they may use the past tense for some verbs, even for the future. And they'll mm -hmm. put in an auxiliary in the front of that to show that they're talking about the future. Uh, and that's something that's indicative of the Niger-Congo region where they use uh, verbs without a past or future tense sometimes. And they may have to add something else to state when. Um, so Jamaican English itself is actually an Africanism. Um, mm -hmm. And the Maroons that live in the middle of the country in the highlands, they actually speak a different language. And they were able to trace that back to a language spoken in Ghana. And I forgot exactly which one, but uh, yeah, they were able to trace it back. Um, and as a matter of fact, the term Maroon corresponds to the name of a tribe in Ghana, also called the Maroon. They usually spell it M-A-R-U-N. Um, mm -hmm. And they were known for being very difficult to enslave. So when some of the Maroons um, in Jamaica became Maroons, the Spaniards may have called them this based on the word cimarron, meaning wild horse, but they themselves were using this uh, based on a, a, a tribe that was not easy to enslave. Um, so that was, uh, that's one of the most um, uh, famous Africanisms that's in popular culture that we don't even know about, really. And a lot of us don't really think about where it came from, even though most Americans are quick to confuse Jamaica with geographically the African continent. Um, okay. And so um, um, let me do a sound check for Litzella right quick. Litzella, okay, he dropped off. He's going to reconnect then. Um, and by the way, uh, there's a power, uh, there's a scheduled power outage. So he may be going to the backup so he can put, uh, put some power to his laptop because the grid is all where he is right now. He said that this was going to happen earlier. Uh... I'm back. All right. All right. So you used... Um, you used that backup, didn't you? Yeah, I am. Gotcha. All right. Excellent. So um, I just got through telling her about how Jamaican English itself is an Africanism and how within Jamaica, there's another language spoken by the Maroons coming out of Ghana. And that's another Africanism. That's, that one's more obvious, but it's lesser known even than Jamaican English. Um, mm -hmm. And um, another Africanism uh, is uh, that... Uh, Believe it or not, and this is something that's going to really blow people's minds, a blue mind uh, away, but vaccines and inoculations come out of the continent. Really? Yeah. They're coming out of Africa. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, people in Gambia and then in Ghana, specifically the Akan people, were observed using, um, uh, using small doses of smallpox to inoculate people against it as a vaccine. And uh, the thing was that there was brought to the, um, to the Americas by some Africans, but it became known about when one man who was enslaved uh, and his name was um, one Isthmus. Um, he was enslaved in Boston, Massachusetts and, and his birth name is not really known. Um, but he was named by the uh, minister that bought him. He was bought by a, a, a Puritan minister named Cotton Mather. And uh, one Isthmus, I'm sorry, one, Isth one Simmons, I'm mispronouncing his name, sorry about that. 
one Simmons told Cotton Mather what the procedure was like. And that led to the development of the smallpox vaccine. And it was uh, uh, it became necessary because Boston wound up having um, uh, an outbreak, actually, um, of smallpox. So what he taught was used so that it would uh, slow down the spread because people could then become immune to it before they even caught it. So uh, it changed medicine uh, in the United States. Um, so later on, when the polio vaccine, I think the, yeah, I think the polio vaccine was uh, developed later on um, in the 1900s, but the idea of taking um, the infection itself and weakening it and, and, and lessening its dose and diluting it to make people immune, that came out of the continent. What did they use to administer the vaccine? What, what, what instruments? Do you know what instruments they used? Because I don't imagine that they would have been using syringes already at that time. Um, I don't know what the instruments were. Um, I didn't find that. If I had more time, I probably could have found that out. But um, I don't think they were using syringes either. But uh, Whenever it was, they were going to make sure to try to get it into the body in a, in a sterile form or in a, a non-living or weakened form. Now, what this means is, and it implies is that um, they, knew of the, they, they knew about microbes before Europeans knew about it. Because we know that in, in the colonial days of what's now the United States, we know that in that time period, people had all kinds of different beliefs about how diseases spread. But microbes were not generally thought of to be the reason, not in these areas. Um, and this is one of the reasons that um, herbalists and root doctors that were enslaved were um, better doctors than Europeans at that time. Um, so, I mean, they later on found out uh, there was a man named Pan Pan. Um, and uh, he was able to use an herbal treatment to cure um, syphilis and another disease called yaws, which normally thrived in the tropics. Uh, there was uh, a man named Samson and he developed the rattlesnake bite cure. He proved it in South Carolina in 1754. Um, he, he put several rattlesnakes against him until they bit him and he returned. And then three days later, he came back completely recovered because he used an herbal concoction. Uh -huh. um, so he was freed and he was given a cash annuity for the rest of his life. And um, then there was a, a lady named Jane Minor that was using medical expertise from the continent and uh, it, it came in handy in 1825 in Virginia. And uh, she went ahead and used the money to start a hospital. Um, and she used the hospital then to free 16 slaves. Um, and they could trace some of wow. these things back to a con women using inoculation to prevent their children from getting yaws. And uh, usually it was midwives that brought these skills. Um, so yeah, it was midwives that would bring a lot of the skills to the new world. And um, they delivered like what nice is the, what, what is the condition that they were they were preventing? Uh against yeah, yeah Y A W S. It's okay. Uh, what is that? Now that's the disease that starts with some skin boils, but then later on um it messes up uh it can get after the skin heals, the problem is that um it gets into the bones and it can cause deformities. Um, it's known to spread in the tropics usually, um, and it, it's not really passed through sexual contact, but it is passed through contact. And yeah, it's passed oh, through okay. contact. Usually when the skin uh, boils will bust, um, some of that fluid, um, it usually passes through kids because they're out playing. And um, so when the, when the boils bust and um, the kids are, are playing with each other, if the, the, the pus gets on the skin of another person, then it can spread that way. Mm. Okay. But to date, that's how they say boils spread. I'm sorry. Like if you get a boil, if you get a boil mm -hmm. and the pus goes to another part of your body, it will heal, and then that's the next part of your body will get another boil. Okay, I see what you mean. The, the boils will spread from, they'll spread uh, outwardly. From uh from a central focal point, is that what you mean? Yeah, like it's hard to treat boils because especially once it's once the pus moves to another part of your body, because then it will it will also get another boil. 
Mm-hmm. I think that's what that's how they treat boils here. Okay, it makes sense uh, because um, yeah, it will make sense because what you get once it busts, if it that that pus, even though that has a lot of the, uh, uh, and I'm going into medicine here, even though that has um, uh, the antibodies against it, it also has uh, the the pathogen that the antibodies are fighting, and yeah. so. Um, the thing is that the other, the, the anti, the, the pathogens will spread themselves, but the antibodies fighting the pathogens are not necessarily going to translate from one person to another. Um, so it does make sense that they would spread that way, either within the same person, but more so even between people. Yeah. Um, and so um, another, um, another Africanism that spread uh, was um, the way that um, Europeans began to um, farm. Uh, they used to have their own, they have these confined pastures, it used to be, and that's what they did even in, uh, in Europe. But um, Fulani um, herdsmen were uh, known to be expert cattlemen. And so they introduced um, open cattle grazing, and that's still practiced today throughout the Americas. And so um, it's because of them that First, there were only like 500 cattle in 1731, which is before uh, independence. But then just 30 years later, you had uh, almost 7,000. I mean, you had about 6,700 heads of cattle uh, in what were uh, going to be the U.S. colonies in 1761. Uh, there were still the U.S. colonies at that. I mean, they were still British colonies at that point. Um, so 1761, in, in 30 years, it grew from 500 to about 6,700, almost 6,800, based on what um, the Fulani brought in. And uh, the descendants of them, or rather the, I shouldn't even say descendants, but the ones who had the job after the original Fulani um, cattlemen had it, they were called cowboys um, because they were in fact enslaved. And usually um, enslaved males were called boy instead of men. Uh, so, um, they kept on some of these practices, even if they weren't Fulani. And um, as a matter of fact, when, um, when the US started to expand to the West, both in border and then in population later on in both cases, about one in five cowboys um, was black. And what that did was a lot of the, uh, the words that are associated with cattle raising and uh, being a cowboy were also taken um, from words with African origins. So one of them was Bronco. I don't know what language it comes from, but Bronco was one of them. Um, Bukura was another one, Buckaroo and, and Dogi. And these were not normally used for wild um, livestock. But Bukura was also used in some parts to mean white man. To me? Okay. To mean white people, which you would call Mazungu. <laughs> okay. They, uh, yep, they, so Bukra was used in some parts of uh, the U.S. to mean them. The Gullah and Geechee used Bukra to mean them, but they live, of course, they live about as far east as you can get in the southern United States. They live on the coast. But in the West, um, they were using these words to refer to wild uh, livestock um, that needed some taming or that uh, difficult to handle as a, a domestic animal. Um, and so uh, even cattle raising and the whole cowboy culture that's an Africanism. And it's very interesting. It sure is. And uh, the funny thing is my grandmother turned out to be a descendant of them, um, which makes my dad a descendant of them as well. Um, and to a certain extent, they still have a lot of the uh, attitudes and philosophies of life that were associated with them, um, mm. even to this day. So, I mean, for instance, I can visit my parents' house um, but I would not be allowed to live there. That's that's the custom from which my dad comes. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's also a custom. Okay, that the grown son can visit but can't live there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wait, when? After they're married? You or can't even before s- they're married? You can't even sleep in your parents' house once you grow up. Oh, wait. Okay. Yeah. Even Even if you're not married, Yeah, once you become, okay, maybe now people are doing it, but according to our culture, you cannot sleep. Once you become a man, 
maybe mm. at like a, when you're a man of a certain age, you can't sleep in your parents' house. Okay. You've got to have your own house. Yeah, you have to have your own house. Um, what age would that be traditionally? I think maybe once you go through circumcision, but you know, us guys never used to circumcise people. So maybe once your teeth are removed, because that's when you move from childhood to adulthood. Okay, you mean when your adult teeth grow in? No. Okay, for the laws used to remove the six lower teeth. It, it was a rite of passage to okay. show, while others used to circumcise their boys, the laws used to mm. remove teeth. Yeah. Okay. So okay. once you've gone through that rite of passage, that's when you stop sleeping in your parents' house. Mm hmm. Okay. So the it. law would not circumcise their boy children, but they would take the one of the teeth out. Yeah, it, that but taking of the teeth out was for both girls and boys. Now, for the girls, okay. you are supposed to sleep at your grandparents' house. For girls. Yeah. For the boys, you have to build a house, and if you cannot build a house, you go to your brother's house. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Until you get married. Even after marriage, you still can't sleep in your parents' house. <laughs> like right now, if I, you know, I find it weird that people actually have relations in their parents' houses. If that happened here, my parents will have to leave that house and it, then it becomes mine. They can't sleep there ever again. Okay. If what happened? Yeah. If you had sexual relations with anyone in your parents' house. Oh, yeah. your parents would vacate. <laughs> and it's not just your mother or father, even maybe your father's. Like, I remember I told you about how we, your father's brothers are considered, are considered your fathers. So everyone in that mm -hmm. generation, you cannot. Oh, my word. Wow. Yeah. It's very sacred. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Okay. It still happens. So yeah, I can that confirm that that still happens. Yeah, it does. Right now, I sleep in wow. my mother's house. But but if you, my cousins, my older cousins, they would not. They would sleep in my grandmother's house. Okay. Wow. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. I see. Okay. All right. Um, well, uh, uh, that, I'm not... that, that was kept as well among that Alex is... people in the yeah. <laughs> in America. Well, amongst my dad's family, um, yeah, the male children had to get out. The, the, uh, the, pra the plate would be broken at age 18 for the male children, um, for the sons. And uh, they were allowed to sleep overnight as a visit, but they just weren't allowed to, to, to live okay. there. And um, now, if my parents got ill and I wanted to take care of them, that would be okay. I've been allowed to live there on a temporary basis um, for work reasons, um, but uh, um, but yeah, I've not. Um, I wouldn't be allowed to, let's say, go back in indefinitely. I don't think six months. Um, and consequently, that's one of the reasons that when my parents start talking, most of when my dad starts talking about moving back to the U.S., I say no, that's okay, because. Uh, if if I if I'm not allowed to stay in that house, even if I paid rent, then that means I can live wherever I can pay rent. And so if I have a, if I find a better job outside of the U.S. and um, uh, and I'm I'm safer, then I'll just stay where I'm safe and where I have a better job and everything else. And so because of that, he can't say uh, come back to the U.S. unless he says come back to the house because mom or I need you. And then that's the case. Yeah, gladly I would do it, but. Um, that comes with something too. And that is they can't tell me where to live at all. It's, it's not up to them. If it's not under their roof, it is not up to them where I live until they decide to foot the bill for it, which they don't have to do, I'm too old. But um, they do have that mindset. Whereas the funny thing is um, the wealthier European Americans don't really have that mindset. But that's another topic for another day. Um, the, um, I guess the last thing I'll cover today uh, is going to be about food. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I will admit that uh, what I'm discussing in this case um, is going to be 
uh, this is also largely uh, dealing with the Americas, but I may have to do a separate one on the spread of African dishes or African crops to different parts of the world in general, uh, as well as what came into Africa from the outside, like the banana. Um, let's see here. So, okay, sorry. I was looking at a list just now because I don't memorize these things, but uh, looking at the list, uh, that list just went off. So give me a moment, I'm pulling it back up. All right, sorry, that list keeps going off. Mm. Well, anyway, um, some of the names of foods, um, well, some of the foods, they don't, it's not necessarily the names that survived. Some of the names of foods survived as well. Um, and maybe in a different form. Um, but uh, one example is going to be okra. Now, okra has different names in different parts of Africa. Um, I'm not sure which language the name okra came from itself, but okra is mm. specifically an African crop, uh, and it's become pretty much instrumental in the United States. Um, but the thing I found is that okra is actually used in a whole lot of places uh, outside of Africa, um, even in the Middle East. The, the name for it in Arabic is Bamiya, so it's a different name, but it's used widely, uh, even in the Middle East, um, starting from North Africa, and then it was spread uh, to other parts of the Middle East from there. Um, but um, in the U.S., uh, African Americans still cook with okra a lot, and Southern whites have begun to use okra, um, and both of them like to fry okra. Yeah, both like to fry okra. Uh, see another one. Uh, the tomato was not an African crop. Um, it was brought into Africa from the Americas. Um, so that's an example of, of the opposite. But um, there is a, uh, oh, gumbo. Now that is something that is used and that's, that's cooked along the Gulf Coast where I'm from. Um, Louisiana is famous for gumbo, but really you find gumbo all along the Gulf Coast of the United States, that, that whole Interstate 10 corridor, um, Houston and east of Houston. So gumbo actually comes from the Congo. I don't know gumbo. Let me Google it. Unfortunately, you... I was never mm -hmm. able to get gumbo. When you worked here, I was never able to get gumbo uh, and, and uh, transport it like I wanted to. Um, yeah. Because it How won't keep that long. G-U-M-B-O. Oh, yeah. Here, it's a soup, eh? or, or it can make soup. Uh, it is a type of soup. Okay. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's a type yeah, of soup. I see here they say it's popular in Louisiana. Yeah, Louisiana is famous for it, but in actuality, you can go to the Gulf Coast of uh, Mississippi, uh, the Gulf Coast of Alabama as well. Houston, it's the same thing. Um, it is quite mm. popular in Houston. Um, it looks good too. It is. It looks delicious. This making me hungry now. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, if I could find a way to transport it and keep it, then I would. Um, I would have brought yeah. some back, but it just wasn't. It wasn't one of those things that was. Uh, it's. It's not something that's easily uh, moved from place to place. I wish it was, but it's not. Um, but um, let's see. Plantains. I don't know if plantains came from the uh, the Caribbean into Africa, but. Most people seem to think that plantains come out of Africa. I'm, I just I couldn't verify it. I couldn't find out if that was the case. Um, but uh, black eyed peas, uh, those are even though they're used everywhere, um, it was first domesticated in Africa. And it's quite common in the South, the entire South of the United States. Whites eat it, too. Um, and um, let's see. Um, yeah. Jambalaya, along with gumbo, which comes from um, uh, the word in combo coming out of the Congo, along with that, there's another one called jambalaya. Now, some people say jambalaya is a Cajun French word. I don't think it is, to be honest with you. The, the Cajun uh, people eat jambalaya and gumbo. Uh, they're some of the main consumers of it, right along with the Creoles. But uh, jambalaya. Why does it look like Spanish pa paella? I'm looking at jambalaya here. It reminds me of. Paella. I'm also googling what jambalaya is. I better give what you all. What is 
Okay. I, first, I better give you all the spelling of jambalaya then. Uh, mm -hmm. I found it. Okay. All right. So J-A-M, better... small. Hmm? J-A-M-B-A, jambalaya. jambalaya. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All spelled as one word. Um, yeah. And uh, I can vouch for this because I've eaten Senegalese cooking. Uh, what you could call Senegambian cooking because they tend to eat the same. I've eaten Nigerian and Liberian food. Um, and so I can tell you- So what exactly is jambalaya? Is it prone, like fr pr fr fried rice, prone fried rice or something? From the photos, that's what I see. It, that's what it looks like in the photos, but it actually, it, no, it, it, it tastes better than that. Um, it, it's not so much fried rice, but they will call it dirty rice. Um, it just means that it's not a white rice. Uh, but jambalaya, the thing is this, the difference between gumbo and jambalaya are, is really the proportions. Um, you take a stew and you pour it on top of some rice, it's jambalaya. And what goes into the stew, um, it, it, you have a choice as to what can go into the stew, but the, the choices of what goes into the stew are the same as the choices that go into the soup that's called gumbo. So gumbo is usually served with a little a little bit, maybe a large spoonful of white rice put into a bowl of soup. Jambalaya is more so a, a, a pile of rice with a thicker stew poured on top of it. Um, it could even be dry if you want. A lot of times jambalaya is dry, but they throw in whatever meat they want, whatever seafoods they want. Um, and uh, the thing is this, if you take um, tomato and add it to okra, then you're going to have the West African version. And there are other seasonings, I'm sure, that go into it. But the point is that the jambalaya and the gumbo are very similar to the Chebujin uh, dish, which is um, coming out of Seneg Senegambia. Also, a jambalaya is very similar to a Liberian dish called tobagi. Um, pepper soup okay. that you find in West Africa is, um, you could say that it's an influence for the gumbo. Uh, but the name for gumbo came out of Nkombo, which is coming out of Central Africa. It's not coming out of the West. Um, so, uh, and as a matter of fact, there was a chef that did a special on this. Um, he, he's coming out of Louisiana and I think his show is based in the state capital of Louisiana. Um, but he did, he has this show on different foods in Louisiana. And it was one day that he did a, a tribute show, an episode, uh, paying tribute to the African influence in Louisiana's cuisine, which is really Gulf Coast cuisine. Um, and so uh, that's, what's, that's what is really famous. So if you really want to have, let's say you're stuck in the United States and you can't get back to the continent, well, then getting some of uh, that Gulf Coast cooking, especially from the Creoles, maybe as close to African cuisine as you can get. Um, and uh, there are also in, um, in Latin America, you've got other dishes. But since I don't, I don't have much experience with all of these dishes, I really couldn't speak too much on um, the, the correlations. But what I can say is that in Latin America, they eat a lot of plantains. Some of them eat um, chitlins too, which is called mondongo. And um, that's usually the intestinal lining of a particular animal. In the US, it's usually pork. But in Latin America, it, it, they don't specify that it has to be pork. Um, some parts of Latin America actually eat fufu, which is the pounded yam. Um, Wait, what did you say, my, my what? I'm sorry? The, the, the term you used for the intestines. Chitlins and uh, mondongo is what they would call it in some parts of Latin America. They're called chitlins. In Swahili, we call it matumbo. Say this name again. Oh, really? Matumbo, yes. Matumbo, okay, all right. So when you have the intestinal, the same, uh, it's the same in in Guni languages in South Africa. I don't know if it's in all the Guni languages, but in Zulu, it's the same as amatumbo. Amatumbo, and it's eaten oh. as well, right? Say that again. And you guys eat it too. Oh yeah, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Oh wow! And 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 in Kenya, Joanne, mm -hmm. you guys use plantains as well a lot, isn't it? Mm, not as much as Ugandans. Oh, it's, okay. It's, not as much yeah. as Ugandans are the Is ones who are known for plantains. Okay, what's your what's what's your main starch? Mm, ugali, ugali is, is maize flour. 
Yeah, it's Ugali is maize. Yeah. Oh, okay, so it's the same as us here in South Africa. But uh, I heard that maize came with a white man. So what we used to use to make ugali was millet and sorghum. Mm -hmm. so tell yeah, me didn't maize come from America itself? But it Professor did. S? Maize, uh, yeah, maize, we just call it corn. Maize actually came out of the Americas. The original Americans were the ones that um, used it. Uh, they had it, so they grew it and used it. The Europeans just transported it. That was it. Yeah. Um, and of course, now you've got, uh, and the truth be told, that's another topic in and of itself, the foods that the original Americans contributed to the rest of the world. If, if that was in line with our channel, that would be another topic. Um, because, um, I mean, chocolate. Yeah, there's no rule saying that we cannot. I don't know if the audience would tune into it as much. Um, but... I'm, but to give a brief summary of it, I could say that the rest of the world, including Africa, is using some Native American um, things too, like the tomato um, and uh, uh, chocolate actually is an Aztec word. And uh, now well, you've got people using chocolate in various languages with similar translations. Um, and they don't know that they're speaking Aztec when they use that word, even to this day, but it came out of the Aztecs. They just called it chocolate. Oh, wow. And uh, it well, wasn't as sweet then as it is now. When they first served it, it was uh, served as a hot drink, but it was it was sour at that time. It was an acquired taste, according to the Spaniards that first wrote about it. So it was transplanted to Africa as well? Because yep. when I think of chocolate, I think of cocoa, I think of uh, Ghana. Ghana. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it is coming out of there. I mean, the, the cacao is grown now in Ghana and also in Grenada as well. Uh, Grenada grows a lot of spices. Um, along with uh, uh, along with other countries, so that the top uh, cacao producers are uh, well, Ghana and Grenada are among the top ca cacao producers. And I'm aware that Grenada is not in the continent; it's in the Americas. But um, so that means that Ghana is a supplier of it. That is true. But as far as them being the originator, that's that seems to be a plant a transplanted crop. Apparently, cassava is too. Apparently, cassava is also a plant transplanted crop that's now popular in Africa and. We think that it's an African crop, um, mm -hmm. but um, but yeah, the foods that did come out of Africa, um, ironically, once they made it into the Americas, um, if once they became popular in the U.S. or in Brazil, they would wind up becoming popular in other countries. Mm -hmm. So, imagine a Jordanian lady telling you that they have gumbo in her country. Wow, yeah, yeah, I had that. And I asked her to send me a photo. And trust me, it wasn't even authentic by Gulf Coast standards. I know it would not have been authentic by uh, Central African standards, but but it, it's just a way of saying that that idea and that name um, circulated. And she said that it was common to put shrimp in it, which on the Gulf Coast is also common. They would put um, shrimp in the gumbo. It's a, it's a very common selection. Um, mm -hmm. And so... Um, I guess I'll have to do something on the dance later, but the thing is that much of the dance um, you and I covered already, Litzella, when we talked about capoeira as a martial art form and as a dance. Um, if I were going to talk about how it influenced dance, most of the talk would have to be about capoeira. Not all, but most of it would. But fortunately, we covered that. So if you all choose to yeah. continue this the next weekend, then I could probably go into more details outside of it. Yeah, we no, I think we covered a lot of ground today. So this more like interrupted you. It's okay. We can continue next weekend with with dance, dance. Sure, we can continue with dance uh, and dance, um, <laughs> and we may have time to uh, to Let's include see. in uh, religion and folklore. Um, we may have time to include the men. Um, now, okay, let's I, do that uh, next week then. Fair enough. Uh, and, uh, and I'll try like to I'll try to include more about language too because. Um, I didn't go into detail. I did mention that, that uh, it's influenced language, but I didn't go into detail. So if there's time, then after these other topics, and I'll throw in how it influenced, specifically how it influenced uh, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, and uh, English. Yeah. I know. Small loves these kind of topics. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I really do. So, yeah. All right, then. So if it's agreed, then I'll continue more on this uh, the next weekend. 
Lord willing. Sure. Um, and, yeah, uh, sure. I'm looking forward to it. Mungu Akipenda. Kuhiria All right. Um, so, um, so before I, uh, before we sign off, though, before we do anything else, uh, feel free to ask any questions you have or that you think an audience member might have on their mind. And uh, I'll tell you all whatever I know. Yeah, certainly. I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready and waiting. <laughs> no questions. Yeah, no, we'll do that. We'll, we'll send the questions through. All right. Fair enough. Uh, with that being said, thank you all for being patient with me again. And uh, hopefully I helped out some audience members. And um, uh, I look forward to seeing you all next weekend, man. All right. Bye. Uh, all right. All right. Cheers, guys. Take care, everybody. We thank you for bearing with us for another episode of African History Around the Campfire. We look forward to you coming back to see us next week at the same black time on the same African channel. In the meantime, make sure you subscribe and select to be notified. But above that, hit the share button because we all know someone who needs this. See you next week, inshallah.